So uh, um, we'll be talking about how uh, modern C++, we'll go over what that, what that means here in a little bit. Um, using it uh, in a non-trivial, very latency sensitive kind of application, what it, what it tends to do and, and sort of lessons learned from it. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Todd Montgomery, uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, 29 West, uh, doing some high-performance messaging. Uh, acquired by Informatica in 2010, and uh, probably for the last year, been doing my own independent consulting. Um, and Aaron is actually one of those pieces of consulting. So, sort of what we'll go over here is uh, Aaron and C++. We'll give a little bit of a primer of what Aaron is. I give a little bit of background about the kind of environment that it looks like. And we'll talk about what constitutes modern C++. There's actually a term for this, uh, defined by the, the author Scott Meyer. And we'll talk about how it's adopted in Aaron. And lessons we learned, and then sort of what's next. So, Aaron and C++. Aaron tries to provide a really modern messaging transport. So, you know, if you think about the protocols that we have out there that are, that are mostly used in most applications, we use things like TCP. If we're doing telecom, we may be using things like SCTP and a few other base protocols. Um, and if we are doing something in, that's more latency sensitive, we may be using a vast array of different protocols. 29 West provided you know, several of them. But there's other vendors who have provided them as well. Tipco with FTL, uh, you know, Solus with theirs, uh, you know, and lots of others as well. And so, one of the things that are sort of inherent in the, those protocols and the way that they work is that they're actually built on most technology that at best is a little more than 10 years old. So modern approaches have changed drastically in terms of you know, basically the architecture of our CPUs, how systems basically work. So adopting a more modern approach is really what Aaron tries to do. It's a very different architecture than most other implementations. So the first thing is, you know, being one who's looked at messaging for a large number of years, most products are, you know, loaded with features and they're complex. And they're simply just not fast enough. Uh, you know, if you are in trading technologies, you'll know that, you know, they're okay, they're better than they were, but from where they could be, they're still quite a bit away. And it's not about just low latency, it's also about predictable latency. And sorry, it's a little cut off, cut off the top there. Um, so it's not just that latency is low, it's that latency is predictable at all percentiles, or as many as you can get. And it's also not simply about you know, being predictable at low latency when there's hardly anything running, it's also having that when the system is operating at high throughput as well. So we live in a world which is basically multi-everything, multi-core, multi-socket, cloud, and we have a vast array of other kinds of transports that we need to run on. Um, you know, IP and EDP, uh, IPC, but we also have things like Finiman, RDMA, PCIe. We have others that are also coming. So just ignoring those or not treating them as first class citizens doesn't help, right? So Aaron tries to take this in a new approach. And so the team is, you know, myself, Martin Thompson, and Richard Warburton, who've worked on this for about the last two years, a little bit over two years. From a messaging perspective, messaging is fairly simple. You have publishers, you have subscribers, you're going to connect them. They operate over some sort of channel, and within that you may have multiple streams uh, within a channel. And we took the standpoint that we didn't want to have a new framework. We didn't want to create something like JMS you know, 3.0, because we already have JMS 2.0, and it's, it's a big disaster anyway. So we wanted to make something which was not a framework, but a library, something which was very easy to integrate, and it provided the right abstractions that applications can be built on, and from a composable design perspective. We wanted something that was much more closer, instead of to a messaging system, much more, as I mentioned, a messaging transport. So an OSI layer for transport, for message-oriented streams. And it actually has some connotations. We wanted to basically have these five properties that are a part of the OSI layer for transport services. Connection rate, communication, reliability, flow control. Flow control in most messaging systems um, is at best a second class concern, and in most cases it has no concern whatsoever at all. Um, 
congestion control and avoidance. Some situations you want it, some you don't. So you want it to basically be something that can be turned off if necessary. Any idea of multiplexing. As I mentioned, it's a multi-everything world. So you just don't have a single publisher or a single set of subscriber. You have varying demands. Some publishers that are very active, some subscribers are very active. And you also want to have multiple channels, multiple streams within. So we started, Aaron, with the idea of Java because we wanted something that we could iterate on and evolve very, very rapidly. And so we came up originally with a set of design principles that helped us to basically decide if we had two different things, which one to pick, right? And so these are ranked in order of priority. First, garbage free and steady state running was something that you know, for Java, it's not new if you're doing anything with latency, but for most of the Java community, it's not something that is a much of a concern. Smart matching, basically being able to do high throughput and low latency at the same time. Wait free algorithms in the message path. Originally, we used to look at this as log free, but we decided we could do wait free and then change it. Non blocking IO, no exceptional cases, apply the single writer principle, prefer an unshared state, avoid unnecessary data copies. These, are, these different principles actually helped us to, when given a choice, figure out which one would be the best. Because it basically led us to believe it was, any choice would fit into one of these and let us rank them. It's a very interesting thing. This also carries over from not just the Java, but into the C++ side, where we have the ability to basically look at different things and come up with what would be the best way of handling it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Architecturally, um, what Aaron is doing is it's replicating a log from a publisher to a set of subscribers. Okay? Same kind of idea as Kafka in that you're replicating a log. However, Aaron is a little different in that it really means replicating the log, replicating every single thing, including the protocol that is associated with getting that log over to the other side or the other sides. So if we look at here, we look at what's something we call a log buffer that is setting on the publisher, it needs to get to the subscriber. And by extension, we also have other publishers who need to get them to other subscribers. So we need to have the ability to go in both directions. So to do that, you have to put something in the middle. You have to have some sort of media that allows a sender to send to a receiver. And that media could be UDP, Cineband, PCIe, all kinds of different technologies. So the idea of having the media be something which is pluggable was important to us. And as I said, you're just replicating that same log buffer or that log on the subscriber that is on the publisher. But to do that, you have a lot of different housekeeping to do. So we separated that housekeeping into something called a conductor. That conductor takes events and administration commands and basically does the, you know, the administration of those buffers. And then we wrap this into the different pieces or architecturally the pieces that we see. The client is what it integrates with the application, and the media driver does the nasty job of sending things to the network, uh, and, and also has its own you know, administration and everything else, its own conductor. This is basically the architecture. And if you look at the code, you know, we've, we also believe that you should be able to look at the code and see names of classes, names of components that fit into this. So all the components have these names. So there may be some, you know, a little bit of uh, information that's clarifying here, such as we have client conductor and driver conductor, but those by themselves, you know, should give you an idea of what, what, they, what their jobs are and what they do. So that's basically Aaron, but how does C++ fit into this? I mentioned that we did this in, in Java first, and that we've iter iterated on the design in Java. Well, we've also iterated on the design in C++. But we've started by doing this, taking the architecture, and C++ goes on the client side, and basically that's it. So that gives the ability to have a C++ application that talks to a Java application, or Java application that talks to C++, or C++ that talks to C++. The media driver itself you know, can be just Java. Basically, and that's what's currently available. The media driver itself is currently Java. So the first thing is don't panic, okay? Just because it's Java doesn't mean it's slow. In fact, it's quite fast. 
but we do intentionally plan to do a C++ version of the driver. In fact, it's in, it's in the works and it's one of our side projects. So, for the moment, don't be too put off by the fact that, that, the C++, that it's not C++ all the way. Your application is simply writing into shared memory, reading from shared memory, if it's doing C++. And if it's doing IPC, the driver's just there as an administration tool. It's creating files, it's removing them, it's sort of orchestrating things, but it's not in the message path. So again, don't panic. So what constitutes modern C++? So we'll talk about what that really means. And the first thing is, throughout this whole thing, I'll try not to bash. Okay? I'm not going to try to bash C++. I'm going to try not to bash Java. I'm going to try not to bash any other languages. It's going to be hard. It's going to be real hard. But we're going to try to do this in a, you know, a good spirit. So the first thing is, modern C++ is basically Scott Meyer's book. This is a fantastic book. If you, uh, how many of you know this book? Okay, if you, if you do use C++ and you're thinking about using some of the newer features in C++11, get this book. It has a lot of really good examples and a lot of good clarifications. Um, and when you think about C++, modern C++, which means basically C++11 and on, then this is the book to have. Um, it's not a reference. It's more of a, here's what this means, here's how to use it, here's how to not use it, which is just as important, and here's how to think about it. So all that is very, very good. So modern C++. If I had to sum up what modern C++ really means, is resource ownership and lifetime is made a lot more explicit. It also is encapsulated much, much better. This is the, the sort of the founding difference between basically C++ 98 and previous and C++ 11. In all the years in between those two standards, a lot had been learned in terms of how to basically look at object, lifetime, resource ownership, things like that. A lot of the best practices got wrapped up and codified into idioms within C++ 11. So that's the first thing, the idioms that are involved. The first idiom here is resource acquisition is initialization, R-A-I-I. And this is permeated throughout the whole library uh, and, and the language. Here's just a couple examples. Uh, lock guard is a mechanism where when it is instantiated, it, lock, it, it takes a lock, and when it is destructed, it releases a lock. So you can put it on the stack. You can also put it in the object. You can put it wherever you'd like, and wherever it's constructed, it acquires a lock, and when it is destroyed, it releases it. Simple, right? That has a kind of a profound look. Now, this is not new. This has been around since actually in the early 90s. Um, if you look at some of the work that was done by Doug Schmidt and others, um, you know, they were using guards for locks and things like this for a long time. But having them as part of the library took a long time. It wasn't hard so much as it was just, it just took a while for that to permeate to that level where it affected the language itself. Um, unique pointer, another one. Smart pointer, and all the ones that we'll talk about here in a minute. All these are concerned with scope. So when you have the resource acquisition is initialization, you, acquire, you create you know, a unique object when it is, you know, basically comes into scope. And when it goes out of scope, it's automatically released. That would be what unique pointer does for a unique piece, so there's no sharing. And that brings us to the second part, which is smart pointers. Smart pointers have a large impact on the way that you think about you know, uh, resource ownership and lifetime. And here's the three that make it up. You've got you know, shared pointer, which basically is an object which has a reference count, but it's more than that. Yeah, if you're familiar with auto pointer, it's kind of like auto pointer and kind of not. Um, it means that this object is shared in some way. There will be two, at least two, uh, you know, connections to it at any one time. So the ownership, what is the ownership? It's an aggregate ownership at that point, right? It's if you have two different owners, you can only reclaim the object if both of them go away. It's basically codifying 
automatic reference counting. And it's very useful for that purpose. You can move a shared pointer. You can copy a shared pointer. What does copy look like? Well, it means increment the reference count and decrement, right, when you're done with the copy. Um, things like that. So when you use something like shared pointer, it has those semantics, and it does it very effectively and very efficiently. Accessing it is, you know, very efficient. Sorry. Um, unique pointer means that you're going to have exactly one owner of this object, right? So it prevents copying. It prevents, you know, other things. Ah, but it can be moved. Right? So, this is codifying those practices. Weak pointer. Weak pointer is created from a share pointer. So you can create a soft reference. Effectively, it's, okay, to make a very general statement, it's effectively like a soft reference in something like, you know, the JVM. But it's a little different. <laughs> but you can use it the same way that you would normally think about. And if you're thinking, okay, well, shared I get, Reference counting. Uh, okay, unique, that makes sense. A okay, weak pointer is kind of, okay, a soft reference. What happens if I have something that's non-trivial, like a graph, right? How do, I, how, do I, how do I manage that? Well, turns out that this is actually not a bad place to begin. Some languages, you know, are built like this. Automatic reference counting for Rust, for example, and other things. It's not a bad thing to limit yourself in a design. In fact, gives you some very good ideas on how to handle it. And we'll talk a little bit about that and sort of lessons learned. But effectively, weak pointer is there so you can create cyclic graphs. How many of you are familiar with game engines? Okay, here's a question. In a game engine, you may have a physics object. That physics object may also have textures. Don't ask me why, they just sometimes do. Textures may also have physics objects. Don't ask me why, they just sometimes do. What you get a lot of times in game engines is a very cyclic graph of dependencies. Game engines are primarily done in C. How in the world do they deal with cycles? They break it so that when you have to actually access something like that, you do it through some intermediary. A lot of times it's a lookup table. So you don't access just the pointer, you access a lookup table, for example. Just one thing. Weak pointer is like this. Weak pointer sets there, and if shared pointer goes away, you try to access the weak pointer, it says, uh-uh, you can't do that, it's gone. So that technique has influenced, for example, this design. Uh, I've seen firsthand some fairly complex graphs and dependencies that are modeled with this quite elegantly. So it's not, it's not a hindrance at all. C++11 introduced lambdas and function objects. You know, these are nice, they make things uh, very clean, um, they also can be a little tricky, they are very powerful to use, and they just actually clean up code quite a bit. Enough has been said about those, don't really have to talk too much about them. Atomics, atomic operations. So atomic is a, is a part of the library uh, that allows you to do some very interesting atomic things with it. And here's an example, suppose you have a Boolean, you want to do atomic operations on that Boolean. You can just basically say it's a atomic and templatize it instead of said atomic. Um, atomic flag is also another example that has some more tests and sets and some other things on it that are just more convenient. In other words, there's a specialization of stood atomic bool. But you have all kinds of different ones you can do, except ones that you really need to do sometimes. So there is a whole that we'll talk about here that has an impact on air. So, I keep so sorry about the headset here. Um, the idioms, uh, smart pointers, lambdas, atomics, but we also have thread support. So, it was very annoying for many years to have POSIX threads, but not have them as first class citizens within the language. Well, now they are. So, whatever threading you have underneath, you have access to uh, the standard library has Thread, new text, promises, futures. Pretty much everything you would normally think of in a modern kind of setting now. Move construction and assignment is another big part of C++11. That basically means is, uh, how many of you are familiar with copy constructors, things like that? Okay. Move constructors don't have to copy. You just move what you have from one to another. You transfer ownership. That's how it kind of comes back to things like you know, the smart pointers and everything else. 
And the idea of ownership and lifetime has a lot to do with move construction and assignment. We'll talk a little bit about lessons learned from that. And, you know, within the C and C++ you know, community, things like, um, you know, tool chains have always been evolving. You know, it just may have taken a lot, lot long time. Now we have some actually very nice to use tool chains. You know, CMake is great. It can be used on very large projects with very good effect. Um, you know, you may not like the syntax, or you may like the syntax depending on you know how it looks, but it's useful. Google Test, Google Mock, um, and even IDEs that, that are out there like CLine from JetBrains, which I use uh, very heavily. Uh, I'm a big Emacs guy. I've used Emacs for way, way too long, and it took it took actually CLine for me to look at an actual IDE. When I used Eclipse, I actually could not use it. I mean, I could use it. It's just I didn't want to, um, and so. You know, it took something like C-Line, which is a lot better integrated, a lot cleaner, uh, you know, for me to really jump and, you know, actually stop using Emacs for most of C and C++ development. So if you, how many of you use CMake? Okay. If you haven't and you're doing something with C or C++, just take a look. You, you know, use it a couple times, it pays for itself. How many of you used other things like Autoconf and stuff like that? Okay, first thing, if you're using Autoconf, don't fight it, give in um, to what it wants you to do. Um, and then look at CMake. Okay, that's just coming from a long time on a comp user. Um, you know, just for example. So, how does Aaron adopt the C++, uh, the modern C++ way of doing things? Well, the first thing is, you know, shared pointers, unique pointers, they're all the way through the actual code. So here's just a code, here's just an example. If you call something like Aaron and you connect, which is the idea of actually having an object that you can now add publications and add subscriptions to, you get back a share pointer of Aaron. So the idea of the API giving you back already a wrapped item that says, here's how you're to use this, it's reference counted, that's kind of handy, right? So that's, that's kind of the way that this is done. In fact, this also pertains to things like publication. You add a publication, you then try to find it. It's a non-blocking API, so you add it. It may immediately return, but it probably won't, but it gives you back an ID that you can then find it with and giving you a shared pointer. That kind of idea is throughout the whole API, and it's used internally as well. It's very efficient. It also means that when a publication goes out of scope, for example here, once you would leave that scope, that publication then is closed. In the Java version, there's an explicit close that the publication has to do. And for Java developers, this is painful because it's something that they're not used to. Now, you can put a cleaner and other things attached to it, and it'll go away sometime. But, you know, if you're in an environment where you want to know when things happen and control them, you have to do it explicitly. It's kind of nice to have these, these kind of things, these, uh, the ownership and lifetime sort of, you know, built into the language a little bit closer. Lambdas and function objects, uh, there's a couple different ways of specifying callbacks and things like that. So having, this is a, a just a, a lambda that is then passed into the new subscription handler. So when a new subscription is seen, it calls this callback and in, in, in including code there. It makes things a little bit simpler instead of specifying, you know, a, an old style function object, or doing something with a class of an object. Thread support um, is is used standard thread. Now, most C++ 11 and on uh, developers will say that I'm doing this exactly wrong. You should be not actually creating a new thread, you should be doing it with an executor or something like that. Sometimes that works, sometimes that's not. This is just an example, you know, where you can have a thread. You can specify what to run in that thread with a lambda. Uh, you know, when it goes out of scope, it gets clean, it gets closed, things like that. Um, and then also just an example of a lock guard and how a lock guard would look. Uh, with acquiring that mutex, that recursive mutex when it enters scope and getting rid of it when it, uh, when it exits. So that's just a, a couple of examples. So it's basically you know, permeated through the idioms and everything else. That whole list that we looked at has actually been there. So you know, what kind of lessons were learned? This is the, the real meat and what I wanted to really talk about the most here. So you know, 
we look at this list, what kind of things do you think we learned a lot from? What kind of things do you think were painful? Well, the first thing is, we're kind of giving you an idea that, you know, the, these first three things are going to have a profound impact, right? Lambdas and function objects, it's really kind of syntactic sugar in a way, but it, it actually does have some, clear, you know, clarifying effects. But think about things like atomics, okay? What about thread support? Now, thread support's probably a little cleaner, but does it have much of an impact? Move construction assignment, oh, well, latency sensitive support, that may have an impact, right? Tool chain, well, I can tell you that we use CMake, we use Google Test, we use Google Mock, you know, to make sure that we're doing things appropriately and to do unit tests. So let's just start down this list. First, these three cannot be kind of taken apart. They all have things to do with one another. So, stack allocation, Stack allocation is a big one. And the thing I will tell you about smart pointers is give in to your anchor. Give in to smart pointers. Don't try to fight it, okay? Don't try to mold your thinking of what you would normally do in other languages and then use smart pointers for it because you're, you're going to get twisted trying to do what you would normally do. So as we were doing Aaron C++, we had Aaron Java that was being iterated on and we were working on. And we wanted to take C++ and just port it. You could do that, but how does ownership work and what happens with any cycles and how does that, how does that, you know, kind of come about? But once you give in to the anger, you actually come out with something which is much cleaner. So if you just start and look at it and say, these are the tools that I have and let's see what happens. You notice a couple things. So, as this was being done, there's a lot of explicit coupling that is in there. And it's explicit because you've got shared pointer, you've got unique pointer, and weak pointer. How do they interact? If you've got an object, it's sometimes a shared, but it's kind of unique because it's one place where it should be, you know, sort of kept around. How does that work? It makes, it makes coupling <coughs> very explicit because it's not just that there's a reference from here to here. It means that there is this type of reference from here to here, which is a very different thing. So think about that. It makes it, it makes it so that you can see, oh, you know what? Yeah, this, there isn't one place where this is owned. Share pointer is probably the right thing. Or is it really the right thing? Because really, shouldn't there just be one place where it's controlled? Scoping is also a really good thing to look at because it's explicit in this regard. So having it where you know what the scope of an object is can lead you down paths to clean up and to get rid of some things that you don't really need to worry about. Because you know what the explicit scope is. You know when it gets created. You know when it gets destroyed. So I said I wouldn't bash. But I'm going to. I'm going to bash every other language that doesn't have stack allocation. So the lack of stack allocation, whenever you talk to other language designers, <coughs> um, and you say, why doesn't your language provide stack allocation? You get a lot of excuses. And I want to say these are really excuses. You're going to see things like, well, we have escape analysis. You know what analysis, uh, escape analysis always returns? Yes, it escaped. That's what it always returns. There are so many ways to defeat uh, you know, escape analysis. Let's take a look at Go and Escape Analysis. There's a whole doc that keeps getting added to about how many ways it can be defeated. In other words, how <laughs> something leaks and can't be basically put on the stack. Another thing, value types. You don't need stack allocation when you have value types. These are like saying, I don't need an orange because I have an apple. Just because you have a use doesn't mean you have the mechanism. So, it makes me want to do this, okay? Stack allocation is so useful because you don't have to actually allocate. It also is useful because it's dead reckoned by the compiler. It's, what do we want? We want that. There is no data dependent load. There's nothing else that is involved in that. It knows where it is. It can figure it out at compile time. So, this doesn't help you, right? Escape analysis, if it gets defeated, well, guess what? It's not on the stack. Right? 
value type. Well, I don't think that's, okay, that's one use of stack allocation. It is not the mechanism of stack allocation that gives you all the other benefits. In fact, it's, it's, it's kind of like this, right? When you don't have it, you really, really miss it, especially if you're doing anything that has to be fast. Um, okay, enough bashing. From that list, we're not going to take these in order. Um, it might surprise you that move construction and assignment is actually one of those areas that is exceedingly tricky. And the advice I would give here is sometimes you just don't want to move it. Okay? Sometimes you really don't want to use a move constructor or a move assignment operator. And the reason here is covered in depth. Um, and I'm going to summarize this in a very poor way for you know, lots of different talks that talk about move constructors, and how you don't want to use them, and move constructors and why you want to use them. Essentially, it's much more than you think. The concept of move constructors and move assignment operators actually has a very deeper meaning than just simply providing you with that mechanism. Just like stack allocation it can be used in a lot of different ways, it also has a very deep impact on the language itself. So the first thing is, you know, if you're thinking about using it, think about just a second what it implies. It implies that you're moving one object to replace another. That may not be what you want. It's sometimes often better to copy. If you're doing something where the scope of what you have to replace is basically going to go off on its own, you might as well copy it, okay, than to move it. That is, you know, a fairly interesting way of thinking about the way that optimizations interact with one another. When you use a move constructor, you can effectively are saying to the compiler, gross over exaggeration, I know what I want to do here, so don't, you know, do X or Y. And sometimes X and Y could be actually good things. So, there is actually the way that this is codified in the standard. There is the rule of three, the rule of five, and the rule of zero. That basically has the interaction of different constructors, copy constructors, move constructors, and assignment operators and everything else. They give you certain rules. I don't think you need to go on to that length to sort of understand what to do if you just do one more thing. If you think you need to move an object because it's heavy weight, but you need to basically have that state somewhere else, why? Think about it from a higher level for a minute. What is prompting you know, the exercise of having to take the internal state of this object and move it somewhere else? You might think that there is a better solution for that. I'll give you a, a reason why. Within, within Aaron, one of the things that we ran into was the ability to iterate over a set of images or the replication of those log buffers. And we uh, originally, maintaining this array was being used by move constructors. We would just move them from one old array to the next one. The objects themselves were just overlays. There was no ownership of them. There didn't need to be. They could be copied it freely. So doing some micro benchmarks, it turned out instead of moving them, that there are other optimizations that kick in and it would be better to copy them. And that was by looking at it and just sitting there thinking, why do these need to be moved? They're just overlaying the memory. They're not actually owning anything. They could go away on the stack. So how do they get, how do they get managed? But the biggest lesson we learned was that sometimes language features aren't built for the things you need to do. Stood atop, for example. So it kind of led us to think of this. Anybody know this reference, by the way? Anybody seen the movie Dune? Okay. I'm a big geek. Um, architecturally, let's think about look look again at sort of the architecture. The C++ pieces, you know, the client pieces here, they interact with the media driver at this layer, which means these are ring and broadcast buffers, shared memory, and these are log buffers, which are shared memory. So, you know, if we had these different data structures that operated on shared memory that needed to sort of work together. Now, really quickly, 
What does Aaron do? Well, it replicates a persistent log. How does it do that? Well, it has a file, and it operates on that file by putting messages in. Let's slow it down. It increments tail, then writes the message, then it writes the header in that specific order into memory. We lay these things out with multiple sort of terms. That's you know sort of the, the area that we just talked about. With metadata and even log metadata. All of these have atomic and ordered memory operations for them. So you would think, it's atomic, that's, you need that right in there, right? What gets even worse than that? So we have the concept of a position within a log, which is basically a unique identification of a byte within each stream. The publisher, senders, receivers, and subscribers all keep position counters in memory. They're key to flow control and monitoring. They're shared memory pieces that have an order to them. There's atomic operations on them. There's also ordered, you know, memory order semantics that are attached to them. So you would think, stand at stood atomic, you know, all over the place, right? Well, looking at stood atomic, you have multiple challenges. The first, size and layout. Is it the same between Java and C? Is it the same from different C compilers to one another? Okay? And the memory models, C11 to Java. C11 actually has a memory model. So what does it look like? Well, it turns out size matters. Okay. I'm a big guy too. Sometimes I do feel like this. Um, and and uh, basically size matters in a couple different ways. Stood atomic was not designed for arbitrary memory access. So you can't say something like, I want a stood atomic and I want to put it at this memory location. You, you can kind of fudge that, but you don't want to because there, it's very you know, compiler specific to do that. And beyond that, the size may not be the size of the type. So you may say something like, I want a 32-bit integer, and so the topic will say, that's great, I'm going to give you a 64-bit. Because there's nothing in the standard that says that it's laid out as a particular way. It says it has to have a particular layout, but it doesn't have to have the exact layout. Some compilers do this differently than others. Mostly, it's okay. Mostly, they are, you know, the same layout. But they're not guaranteed to be. And some compilers can get very interesting when you talk about undefined behavior, which is where this starts to basically come into play. The thing is, Stood Atomic is concerned only with the operations and provides you with a variable. They're not interested in looking at a particular memory location. Okay, so that, that makes it very hard. What about the interoperability with the Java memory? Well, the memory order, stood memory order, allows you to sort of specify different ways that things should operate. Java's memory model, and here, here's the real big difference. C++11 memory model says this generates this set of instructions on these you know, architectures. So it's basically, here's what gets generated. Java memory model says, if these, this thing happened before this thing and had this relationship, and it happens after this relationship, and had this relationship, these are two different ways of specifying things. Which means that you can't really take and say these set of instructions, you know, go to go to this. They are slightly different, so they're a little bit. It's like looking at memory order and saying it's not really fit for purpose with the Java memory model. It's not that it's wrong, so much as what turns out is C++ 11 is much more conservative with what it allows code to migrate up and before and after operations. So what did this lead to? Well, we tried different things. We tried Minatomic, uh, Mintomic actually, um, and we had some various problems with getting that to work until um, we had a contributor who basically said, you know what, let's just go through the JVM, take the instructions that are generated for all the different types and unsafe and port them over. So that's what we did. We basically took you know, and have our own operations, C++, C++ functions that are J, Java memory model compatible. So when you say something like put int volatile, it does effectively the same instruction on the, you know, on x86 that that would be do, that would do with the Java memory model. So we identified this up front, that we kind of needed this. We played around with various things. This is where we landed. Um, if you're doing this with Windows, you have to do things slightly differently. 
but effectively it generates the same code. Visual C++ is good about that. So, wrap up here, give us a little bit of time for questions. Sort of what's next? Um, and I'll cover sort of, you know, where we stand. It says IPC 32 byte messages at the top there. So where does C++ stand? If you're looking at IPC, you're looking at just the language. A message is sent, it goes, it's, it goes through, you know, a set of operations that append to a log buffer. A receiver reads that, and that's all that there is. The driver has no impact on that. So the fact that your Java has no impact on that message path, okay, for the driver. C++ to C++, 32 million messages per second. Okay, that's not bad. How does that stack up with the rest of the things? Well, Java is 30, and we actually have a .NET port that's just, just starting to, within the last week, you know, have the capability of running these, and it's at 15 million. Actually, C, uh, C Sharp coming in at 15 million is actually about where we started with Java. So it, this will only get better. But still notice that C++ is a little bit better. Why do you think that might be? other than the fact that we're awesome. Mostly it's, uh, it, mostly it's compiler optimizations. So there's a lot of compiler optimizations that are done in C++ and C that haven't made their way to you know, the JIT compilers. Eventually they will, but there are optimizations that are done. There's also a few things that we, have, that we do that we know we can elicit more optimizations. So, you know, what's next? Well, we've been working on Persistence and replication. Uh, we've been also talking about, you know, doing encryption and security, various aspects. Um, efficient FEC forward error correction. Uh, the design of the log buffer structure allows us to do some very interesting things from a, from an error correcting code standpoint. Um, error one point uh, is something that uh, is is imminent. Um, and uh, there's always performance things, uh, and there's actually quite a few things that can be done here. I figure there's probably just with some C++ specific things that could get another three million out of this, just conservatively. So I think this can actually get better. Um, and uh, uh, also we've been working on a C++ driver for a while um, and multiple Unicat things. Most of this, aside, you know, most of this actually is things that we've been doing in our own time. Uh, you know, some of the there's some sponsored work. Uh, that we've been looking at for persistence and replication. Um, so there's, there's interesting things. So in closing, so we, we went after Aaron with a very different design. Um, I've written a lot of protocols and uh, you know, when you think you know how to do something, you probably should actually ask someone else, how would they do it? Because they'll come up with ideas that you never would have thought of. Um, Working with Martin has been is a real joy in that he's not afraid to try new things and he drives you to try new things and see what, see what happens. And that's what really has evolved with Aaron is trying new things, different things, seeing what happens and you know, seeing what you can do. So if I had to say one thing is, try to put this up for every Aaron talk that we give. Um, you know, try new things and, and see what happens. You can find Aaron, you can find the C++ uh, code as well uh, at, uh, at GitHub here, and uh, I think we have about five, six minutes for questions.